Oh, and we did Puck Doku today. We were the guest puzzle master. Oh, I'm going to have to do it then. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It today. All right. In fact, one of the categories. <clears throat> he qualifies for it? He qualifies. <laughs> All right. All right, we're rolling. With TSN hockey analyst and former Vancouver Canuck, Mr. Frank Corrado. How are we doing, Frankie? I'm good. I'm very I'm I'm hearing things are very good on the West Coast. And I think it's appropriate. I think it's appropriate for a number of reasons, none of which have to do with the product on the ice, which has been very good. But based on the fact that I will be returning to Vancouver this Friday to play in the Canucks Autism Network charity tournament. And I I know there's been some dark days the last few years, but I know when I first got to the city, the team was a great team in great shape. There were some dark years, but I'm returning to the city with the Canucks uniform on this weekend. And I can't help but think that's the only reason why. I hope you sense my sarcasm. Yeah, well, I was going to say to steal a line, finally, Frank Corrado has come back to Vancouver. Uh, We can't wait to see you here. That is finally in town. Great Frank Corrado Canucks asset management. Finally, that's right. Back back in the green and blue. Like I have, I, I, you got to think we're wearing Canucks colors this weekend, right? Well, maybe one side's in green and blue, the other side's in black, yellow, Mm -hmm. and red. I don't know what the format is. Frank, I don't know. The day you were claimed on waivers by the Leafs and left town, was that the last time you were here? No, because I returned with the Leafs uh, twice, returned with the Penguins. Um, But yeah, and you know what I never knew? I never knew what was going on in the visitor's room in Vancouver. Did you know that the visiting team gets like this assortment of homemade like beef jerkies? Yes. You ever heard John, about this? I think John brings that in, doesn't he? Yeah. He yeah. brings it in. Yeah. And yeah. and I said mm-hmm. I said hi to him a million times when I played for the Canucks. Hey, how's it going? All this stuff. Had no idea this existed until I came back with the Leafs and I said like what's what's going on? Why has this been why has this eluded me for so long? Is like this is this is just for the visiting team. Well, Johnny's a legend there working the uh, visitors room for years and years. As a matter of fact, we went to Friday's game with your friend Piero Mineta right there, right behind the visitors' bench, uh, we caught up with Johnny. In fact, Piero bought uh, Johnny some candy from the uh, concession stand, and then Piero told us the story that you gave his son Francesco a stick once or upon tried a time. To, tried to when you were a rookie, but then the, you got okay. a stir, you got a stern look from a from a uh, an NHL official, so you had to alligator arm it back because you were afraid of getting in trouble. I could see that. I could see that being the case. <laughs> I think. Something happened along the way where I just kind of thought, like, we just sticks. No pro. Here you go. Who yeah. wants a stick? You know what I mean? You ask, no problem. And then I, I kind of learned it's like, yeah, you can't really just hand them out like that. Like, you got to pick your spots a little bit. So we learned. We learned along the way, and we're better for it. Uh, what did you make of the game last night? Very good game. Uh, very good. I, I thought I had a great performance. And there's so many things that happen in that game, like little subplots, whether it's the JT Miller benching, like Quinn Hughes doing his thing again, Elias Pettersson kind of leading the charge up front. Um, I just think like when I when I watch the team play right now, I can understand what they're trying to do. I understand the schemes. I understand what they're thinking on the ice. You're not going to execute every single time, but I, I get an appreciation for the fact that they're going out there with a plan and more often than not, they're executing on it. And, Uh, I mean, listen, let's be honest, Nashville coming into the season, I think a lot of people had lumped into a category with the Canucks. I don't know if you wanted to put like Nashville, St. Louis, Vancouver, kind of in that middle ground. Vancouver's head and shoulders above Nashville. They are a much better team. They're they're not in that category. And they showed that last night. Um, Number of great individual performances, which has always been the case with the Canucks, even over the last few years, like you get a lot of those individual performances, but as a team, um, they are just much sharper, much, much more crisp. And when things go awry in a game, it's nice to know that you have a little something to kind of default to, to, to manage kind of momentum waves. And they look good. Like they look very good right now. So um, answer me this. And one of your great gifts, my friend, is as a communicator, someone who can take uh, hockey stuff and make it digestible for the average hockey fan. And we're seeing you're doing that with, these Twitter breakdown videos more on those in a second. But when you say, I understand what they're trying to do. I understand the scheme and everything. Tell us, dumb it down for us. What are they trying to do out there? What's the plan? 
I think, okay, so a lot of it starts off a face-off, right? Everyone knows, like, you need to have a plan going into a face-off. So you have to have probably two or three things that you can execute on when it's a defensive zone face-off that you, you think can get you out of the zone and with possession and get you going offensively. When, when I see that, there's there's not a lot of, like, guesswork. I, I feel like they know what they want to do. They execute it. I did a video on that the other day. It's called the... Uh, strong side reverse they executed great and Sam Lafferty got a chance on that so that's one thing but I just think it's one of those things where there's certain cues on the ice where if a forward let's say has the puck in the offensive zone and he starts skating towards the defenseman it's like something clicks in the defenseman's head where he knows he's got two options now he's either going to slide to the middle of the ice to try and bring the person who's covering him over a little more create a little bit of space or he's going to jump through and see if he can create something that way and then the next person sees that and they're like, now I need to take the middle of the ice. So it's just, I just feel like there's a few more cues on the ice that players can pick up on. So you add layers of support to it and you're still going to have breakdowns. Like I think the Tyler Myers one last night where he gets caught and it goes to the, it, it turns into a penalty shot. Like I would like to see him just kind of be a little more patient there. You know what I mean? Like the pass gets made early. He thinks he's going to hope and go out there with his 14 foot hockey stick and kind of disrupt it. But he probably should just – so there's going to be breakdowns, but it's fewer and further between, and they're further away from the net, and they're not leading to, like, these glorious grade-A chances, like these barrage of chances that we've seen the last few years. So uh, it's just I, – I think they're they're on the same page more often than not, and I give Rick Tockett a lot of credit and the players for kind of buying in and executing. They got away with one on game two of the season. Game three and four weren't great. But since then, they've been in every game. They've been dominating some games. To now the point where last night, they're kind of even really in shots on goal and and pressure. And they take that as a loss last night almost. They come away with a 5-2 score line. And there was a lot of criticism from within the their own dressing room about how they played. Um, I mean, you don't want to be too self-deprecating, but... But is that a good sign, Frank, that they hold themselves to a much – is the bar that much raised now where they win 5-2 to two and they, they walk off the ice going, we still did not play very well here tonight? Yeah, the, the bar has been raised, and I would say that just leads to, like, the belief that there is in the group that there is a, a higher standard for what they're able to do. And I think, like, you create that evidence yourself by how you play. So when, when you go out there and you know, okay – you, you have this one game or this stretch of games where you're like, guys, that's the standard for our group. Let everyone know, like in this room, outside of this room, that's what we can play like. And when you don't achieve that standard, of course, you want to win games because that goes back to the old adage of like, you know, good teams find ways to win no matter what. Or the old cliche where it's, uh, you know, good teams can beat you any different kind of way. So if you want to be a good team, you're going to have to win when you don't necessarily have your A stuff. And that's when you, you lean on your star players to have those great individual flashes of brilliance along the way. But I agree. Like, I think it's one of those things where, you know, the, the Fabro goal, the Dante Fabro goal last night, I would imagine when they're doing their video, that's the first clip today. And it's like, okay, how do we how do we address this situation moving forward? You're going to have the good times reels going, right? You're going to have the Pedersen loop. You're going to give everyone their flowers at the end of the video session. But it's like, this is business first. And then we can, we can kind of like digest and go through all the great things afterwards. Because, you know, I looked at that play and I'm like, all right, that's one of those ones where maybe you need a little tightening up. Because you haven't seen that very much. They broke you in the middle of the ice. Now the defenseman, like, he had the puck twice in the middle of the ice, and, and it kind of got scattered, where it's like, just go to that guy, force him to make the pass to the outside, and let Demko kind of look at it on one side of the ice instead of having to cipher, is Di Giuseppe going to block it? Is Nyquist, is it going to hit him? Which way do I slide? And we saw him get, you know, caught sliding the other way. It's like, let's force... Once it's to the middle, we got to funnel to the side. I think that's the, the main takeaway on that one. But you're right. Like, if you're getting into the nitpicking kind of stuff, I think that's very encouraging for your group because you're talking about smaller things now and not massive things that are, like, very obvious in a game. One of the things that's been very instructive to uh, us and our audience, Frank, is your time with Rick Tockett and being able to speak knowing uh, f uh, about the man on the ice and, and what he asked for and off the ice in the video sessions and understanding what he's asking for. He seems to have a Midas touch right now. I'd like to know your thoughts on the benching of JT Miller, the spot he picked, the way he brought him back, and the response from the player himself. 
Yeah, it's, it's so hard to buy into this notion when you're a player. But every once in a while, whether it's a benching or a healthy scratch, and JT Miller's not in the healthy scratch category, let's make that very clear. But sometimes a coach or a GM will tell you, you just need a little reset. Don't think of it as a punishment. You just need a reset. And automatically, like me, the first thing that goes through my head is like, screw you. I don't need a reset. Don't say that to me. I'm fine, right? But there's certain guys that can hear that and say, yeah, you know what? I'm just running hot and I, I, I can do it. I, I just need the reset. It's all good. You know, I'll find it for you here. I think JT Miller might be the latter. Like, I think he might be one of those guys where it's like, oh man, yeah, I am running hot out there. You know, that was a little undisciplined. I'm, I, you know, give me a little time and I'll, I'll get it sorted out here. So kudos to him for that. I, I know at times JT Miller runs hot and, and you think maybe it lacks maturity. But I think the way he responded last night shows a lot of maturity. Uh, so give him credit. And I think Talkit has this way of communicating where, first of all, he has a lot of credibility because he was a player. He's been through the grind. He understands that. And he's not asking you to do something that he doesn't know you can do. Like he's not asking you to do something that's out of your wheelhouse, which I think is very important. Um, you know, and I think coaches sometimes have unreal, unrealistic expectations for players, whether it's on the ice or, you know, just even their mentality and mindset around the room and stuff like that. But like, he's not one of those guys, like whatever's in your wheelhouse, that's what he's asking for you. He knows you can find a way to do it. Um, and it comes from a place of understanding what it's like to be a player, which I think is very important for guys. There's a certain level of credibility where you, you leave a conversation with them and you're like, that's a guy who's been through it, understands it, knows what he's talking about, as opposed to some guys where you're like, that guy's kind of a fraud. You know, like he just, it, it, it's disingenuous. And I, I, don't, I don't think he even knows me at all. Talk it is not that that guy. He's, he's as genuine and authentic as it gets. We're asking on our poll question about trophies for this coming year. And, and Talk it, we, we predicted at the outset, Talk it was uh, a, a likely long list candidate because taking a an you know a slightly below average team and making them slightly above average uh, generally gets you a long way in in, in that sort of uh, recognition. Um, so he's he's on our list, and maybe your vote goes that way. The other guys are obvious: the goalie, the defenseman, the forward. The thing with with the three players that we've got listed. Frank, it doesn't look like they're even trying that hard at this point. Like Demko's not standing on his head. Looks spectacular. Quinn Hughes looks like he's out for a Sunday jog and he's doing what he's doing. And Elias Pettersson, he's getting three points playing kind of good. Like it's 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 unbelievable. Like if they ever do find another level, I don't know what even how to describe that. What does that even look like? I think so. The thing with Quinn Hughes kind of like looking like he's out for a skate. I just think that's him. In I that, know. You know, people will say it's like flow state for an athlete, you know, where you're just not thinking about anything. You're totally in the zone. That's what it looks like for him. And I hate using this term. I had I had someone reach out to me once, a hockey former hockey player. And I had said the word cerebral. And he goes, look up what cerebral means in the dictionary and, and online and tell me what the interpretation was. And it was something along the lines of like lacking emotion, right? Like I I, I think I, I remember that's what like you're, like you're a, thinking, automaton, right? like an automaton. Yeah, but like or, you're, yeah. you're lacking you're lacking emotion. Yeah. And he goes, when you see that hockey player play, does he lack emotion to you? Mm. I said, no, he's just no. very smart and he's yeah. methodical. He goes right there. He goes, that's the word you want to be using methodical, right? Like you still have, you still have to have a lot of passion and emotion to play a good game. Yeah. And that's where I am with Elias Pettersson, where it's not cerebral because he does have emotion. He does have passion. He's playing so well, For but sure. he's methodical. He's such a thinker on the ice. And, you know, the, the goal he scores last night off the rush, I think, is a great example of that. Gets the blue line. And it's like he knows he wants to get to the middle of the ice, but he goes about it in a way where he keeps everyone kind of on their heels, thinking he like, could go this way. He could go back to the outside. And sure enough, he, like, double clutches it just enough to get his shot off in a prime enough scoring area and beat the goalie. And there's just enough on the shot. Like, yeah, cerebral, he thinks, but... It's methodical, right? So I, I think that's important to point out with him. As far as like the Jack Adams goes, I think that's an interesting conversation because if the Canucks just made the playoffs, I, I don't know if that warrants, you know, Jack Adams. But if we're talking about a Canucks team that is like near the top of the division, if they're a three seed or a two seed, my goodness, place in, yeah, I think that's, ahead. I think that's, 
I think that's like nomination worthy. And yeah. I don't even think, I know that's nomination worthy. And there's going to be like, you look at the standings right now, Boston's atop the Atlantic, Detroit is second in the Atlantic. Like we'll see, like Boston, I think is going to be there at the end of the day, maybe not at top, but they're going to be there. Like, is Detroit going to be there? I don't know. But if they are, like Derek, Derek Lalonde is going to get a, a look and, and a lot of votes as well. So there's going to be a lot of company there. Uh, but think about this, like, if everything goes well for the Canucks, Rick Tockett could be a nominee for the Adams. Quinn Hughes is going to be, like, I have a feeling he's going to be a top three nominee for the Norse. I just, like, with the way he's playing right now, I, I don't see, like, it's, it's, a, gonna, it's a long It's a season. really good class. It's a really good class, but Ooh, yes. he's, he's playing so well, yeah. He, he can be that guy. Yeah. And I think the, the guys on Spit and Chicklets, I can't remember if it was Whitney or Biz, had a take that if the Canucks made the playoffs, EP should be a heart uh, candidate. I think it's a great take. Like, I, I really do think it's a great take. And, and Thatcher Demko, I know you're saying he's not stand, he hasn't stood on his head. Like, through the first, you know, five or six games, the Canucks kind of like underlying numbers weren't great, but his numbers were fantastic. And it just goes back to that thing where it's like, you just do what you need to do and nothing more. Certain goalies love this. You know, they're, they're athletic, they're acrobatic, they make these crazy saves. And then other guys, they're just so clean and efficient in the way they move that the puck just seems to hit yes. them in the chest. And you're like... You, you don't get an appreciation for, for the technical work that, that goes in behind the scenes. So yeah. there could be some hardware. Like they they have the criteria that fits a number of categories. I, uh, I know you're a defenseman, but one of the storylines to this Canucks season, it seems like we're talking about it on every rink-wide post game, is the traffic and the screens in front. But not just that, Frankie, the shooter's ability to take advantage of the screens and the traffic in front is there an art to a screening a goaltender and is there an art to picking your spot as a shooter because we're looking at three goals last night Pedersen's second goal where he's loading up the one-timer but sees the Bessers in front takes a minute picks his spot and hits it and then the Lafferty and Miller goals last night uh, yeah. examples where the screener is able to knock a rebound home tell me about the art of screening and the art of shooting when you know you've got that screen so the thing I always heard throughout my career was coaches telling who was ever screening the goalie, take away the goalie's eyes. So it's, it was never, hey, you need to screen the goalie. It's, hey, you need to take away the goalie's eyes. And I think when you look at it that way, it just adds like a little sense of awareness. If you're the player in front of the net, like, hey, I'm standing in the blue paint. I'm screening the goalie. Actually, no, you're not because he's looking around you and he's fighting through traffic. So you have to make an active attempt to take away his eyes. So when you have that in mind, like it just, you're a little more assertive in that position. And then as far as the players, you know, shooting the puck past the screen, pretty simple. Don't hit your buddy in front of the net, right? Um, but but Nashville's, like Nashville's penalty kill was interesting last night because I've seen two schools of thought on this right now in the league. There are some teams that are flying out at the half wall positions to say that's, those are the best players in the league, the best players on the team. We're going to limit their time and space and we're going to take our chances with the guys in front of the net. And we're just going to crash down. Our goalie's going to have to make a save, but we're going to give those guys the opportunity over the guys off the half wall because they're way more skilled. Nashville last night wasn't doing that. Like McDonough on the one Pedersen goal was just kind of like hung out, like just didn't really get higher than the dot, was sort of playing goalie. And you give Pedersen that much time and space with a screen in front, like that's a gimme. So good for him for recognizing that. But I wonder if Nashville sees that today and goes, all right, we're, we're not going to do this anymore. We're taking away time and space in the half wall position. All right. Lastly, uh, about this alumni game, the charity game. First of all, do you know about Ronning? Do you know if he's With playing? Ryan? Yes. Yeah. Well, I know who Cliff Ronning is. No, but do you know about Ronning in these games? No, I have no idea. It's okay. my first Canucks uh, alumni game. If oh. he's playing, it's game seven of the Stanley Cup final. Okay. Yeah. It might as well be Madison Square Garden. Yes. Yeah, so I want him on my team. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Now you, because our buddy Kirk McLean doesn't want any part of the crease anymore. He wants to play out. In fact, uh, we hear a lot about defensemen playing forward, forward playing defense. Bring this is your chance to fill some nets here. Yeah. Match PD, get a hattie. Yeah. I think the people of, of Surrey, the good people of Surrey, deserve to see me fill the net. And I'm going to do everything <laughs> I possibly can to make that happen. Yeah, You've been studying Quinn Hughes. Just just go do that. Just go, go do the Hughes thing. 
here here's Quinn Hughes right now, okay? Yeah. It's like when he gets the puck at the point, it's like a three course meal. So he gets the puck, he walks it to the middle, there's the appetizer. That's what most defensemen do. But then he do he does the shimmy shake, the spin off you, and that's the main course. Mm-hmm. Then he walks it downhill and he fires it in the back of the net, and it's like dessert with a little cherry on top. Mm-hmm. Most defensemen just give you the appetizer. Some give you the main course. Not everyone can put together all three meals, but Quinn Hughes can, and I'm going to try to do that this weekend in Surrey. Sam, hey. Laff- Sam Lafferty's helmet stole the dessert. I was going to say, you're Italian. You owe us the antipasto and the sal- insalata yeah. as well. We went five right. courses, okay? Yeah, yeah. Secundi. Uh, <laughs> marvelous stuff, Frankie. Thank you for this. Enjoy your trip here to Vancouver. Yeah, thanks, guys. Take care.